Hi, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and I have the pleasure of being joined by my colleague, Dr. Omar Abu Ezidin, who is a cardiologist, nuclear imager, uh, head of our cardiac sarcoid clinic. And today we're going to be discussing cardiac amyloidosis, another area of his expertise. So Omar, welcome and thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Friedman, for this invitation. Um, why don't we start with the basics? Um, what is cardiac amyloidosis? What are the main things to know about it, and how common is it? Sure. Um, uh, well, cardiac amyloidosis is a uh, pro a infiltrative cardiomyopathy, uh, and there's two main types uh, of uh, cardiac amyloid that we as clinicians should be thinking of. Um, one is truly a medical emergency, and that is light chain amyloid. And the reason that that is an emergency is uh, the uh, source of the uh, amyloid is actually the bone marrow. And uh, in the process of a monoclonal um, um, uh, proliferative disorder, if you want, um, um, the bone marrow is uh, secreting uh, excessive amounts of uh, monoclonal protein, which infiltrate the myocardium and cause an acute uh, necrotic, infiltrative, and restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy. The reason that this is an emergency is uh, outcomes are much poorer than other types of amyloid, and these patients are typically treated with uh, chemotherapy uh, and uh, uh, essentially um, uh, prognosis is uh, typically poor unless we get to these patients early in their disease process to stop this infiltrative process. And, and that's why when we talk about amyloid, even though we may focus more on TTR amyloid in the subsequent portion of this talk, uh, we need to keep in mind that up until the accurate diagnosis of what specific type of amyloid is made, it is considered an emergency to ensure that this isn't of the hematologic subtype. Because if it is, hematologists need to be emergency consulted and chemotherapy initiated as soon as possible. The second subtype, uh, which has garnered a lot of interest recently in uh, the cardiology space, is transthyretin cardiac amyloid, where um, the uh, source of the abnormal, if you want, protein is actually the liver. And that is transthyretin, which is a transporter protein, is uh, either because of genetic reasons or because of uh, uh, age, uh, the, the protein itself is misfolded and uh, unstable. And these proteins, which are tetramers typically, uh, disintegrate into monomers, which form the fibrils, which themselves infiltrate the, the myocardium, causing diastolic dysfunction, uh, um, conduction system abnormalities, heart failure, and ultimately uh, death. So th that second type, it's a bit more indolent. Uh, the course uh, occurs over years, uh, and um, uh, you know, is is a is a we have a luxury of time if you want more so with that process compared to light chain. Uh, now, when, when when do you suspect it? I mean, when when do you think, boy, I should be thinking about amyloid here, and who should we be screening for it? Yeah, um, typically, um, the, the typical suspicion arises, obviously, uh, from a clinical presentation of uh, either diastolic dysfunction or a restrictive cardiomyopathy, restrictive heart failure. Um, uh, that is, it, it could be. Um, uh, echo findings, uh, they could be uh, sometimes MRI findings, uh, and sometimes uh, based on an ECG. So it really uh, depends um, on uh, the patient's presentation. Now, clinically, typically these patients present with, again, heart failure, uh, arrhythmias, um, such as recurrent atrial fibrillation, status post multiple ablation attempts. Um, they could have unexplained proponanemia uh, to reflect the myocardial necrosis that occurs as part of that infiltration. Uh, they also could present with um, 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 uh, other associated systemic signs, particularly if it's the hematologic uh, subtype, uh, such as um, uh, macroglossia, perioral or orbital purpura, neuropathy, gastrointestinal symptoms, proteinuria that's unexplained. Um, now, if we're thinking more of TTR, there seems to be an association which is increasingly recognized with spinal stenosis and carpal tunnel syndrome, 
And um, uh, so if you're seeing a patient who's uh, elderly uh, with uh, diastolic heart failure uh, with a history of carpal tunnel syndrome, then we should be thinking of uh, amyloid in the um, diagnostic uh, process. Um, Typically, these patients um, have a preserved ejection fraction. So uh, the, you, on echocardiogram, you may see increased wall thickness, preserved ejection fraction, and restricted filling. Although as the disease process goes on over time, um, you could uh, end up with uh, some systolic dysfunction as well. So I'll ask you more about how we make the diagnosis in a minute, but I want to, before when we talk about who to suspect, yeah. there are two populations, one of which you alluded to that, that are getting some attention. That one is patients who have AF ablation and have recurrence. Uh, and so how often do you think we should be screening for those? The other one is patients undergoing TAVR. You know, how common is it in that cohort? How often should we be thinking about that? And to answer your question on the prevalence, it, again, uh, it, it depends on the subtype uh, of the subgroup we're looking at. So as right. you have alluded to, uh, among patients who have undergone TAVR, uh, uh, studies uh, from our colleagues at Columbia has shown that up to 16% of patients undergoing TAVR uh, had a positive PYP scan. Up to 5% of patients with severe AS uh, uh, patients undergoing carpal tunnel release, interestingly, up to 10% of uh, patients, males over the age of 50 and females over the age of 60, undergoing carpal tunnel release were found to have uh, a diagnosis of TTR cardiac amyloid. Um, uh, yeah, in Spain, there's recently some data on uh, acute decompensated HEFF patients, up to 13% of them. Now, we have done community studies here in Southeast Minnesota, soon to be published, where we found that in the community population of heart failure with preserved EF, defined as an EF of 40%, and wall thickness of 12 or more, uh, around 6% of uh, patients, 10% male, 2% female, had this diagnosis when screened clinically. Impressively, this was a six-fold recognition uh, compared to prior, uh, priorly, uh, prior to recognized diagnosis. So when we actually actively screened these populations, we increased the diagnosis by 6%. Um, now, ongoing studies on specific risk uh, models to predict who we should be screening are underway, and we recently uh, will be publishing very shortly an artificial intelligence ECG-based model, uh, which uh, I know you have been involved with too, that has been uh, that's shown excellent um, discrimination uh, uh, and identification with an area under the curve that approached 0 0.9, uh, um, uh, in fact. So uh, I think uh, with time, we're going to be become better and better at recognizing um, what patient should be screened based on an ECG or specific clinical criteria. So between, so in other words, between five and 15% of people in our clinics in a, undergoing TAVR and other settings have this important condition. We may not recognize it. The artificial intelligence ECG is one of several tools that may point us to say, hey, better think about this. And the question is, what does it matter? Now let's focus on TTR. Why is it so important to make that diagnosis? Absolutely, for the longest time, uh, TTR, um, and in fact, literature from the 80s uh, would comment about how this is a, a, a uh, diagnosis of diagnostic and academic interest, but without therapeutic consequences. But up until a few years ago, we now have finally, uh, while we previously didn't have therapeutic options, we finally have drugs, a uh, few of them in the pipelines, one that has been FDA approved that has shown a 30% reduction uh, in mortality and hospitalizations in these patients, and that is tefamidus. So uh, not only are we uh, 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 we have the tools now to identify these patients uh, non-invasively, which we can talk about here shortly, but also we have uh, quite effective uh, therapies in cohorts of patients who otherwise may have not had uh, a therapeutic option. Uh, and we're increasingly uh, trying to move towards how do we better phenotype specific 
patient cohorts, such as HEFPEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which as you know, today we don't have really effective therapies for. So if a certain percentage of patients in that group uh, that is very heterogeneous have amyloid and we have a TTR amyloid and we have a drug that is 30% effective, you can see how the implications um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our patients are, are, are quite uh, impressive. How does Defamidus work and what's the patient experience with it in terms of side effects, tolerability, those kinds of things? Sure. So Defamidus is a, a, a compound uh, that stabilizes the transthyretin tetramer. So like I said earlier, the reason that we end up with uh, uh, TTR amyloid pathology, if you want, is because this tetramer uh, disintegrates into monomers, which then form the fibrils that infiltrate the heart. So by stabilizing this tetramer, uh, tefamidus has proven to be quite effective at um, uh, uh, not only uh, um, slowing down the disease process, but also impacting hospitalizations and uh, more mortality or survival. So it's actually, uh, the, this was a randomized clinical trial and, and uh, the arm of patients that uh, received uh, the tefamidus uh, um, had less side effect, if you want, than placebo. Uh, there was really, it was a very, very safe drug. Uh, no monitoring is necessary. Um, um, with uh, the, the uh, clinical uptake, we've noticed some patients may have some gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, but nothing that is intolerable that has at least uh, anecdotally caused me to stop the drug uh, ever. And again, we do not have to monitor anything um, for this drug. It's very, very safe drug. It really underscores why the diagnosis matters. We have a drug that has almost no side effects, lowers mortality, lowers hospitalization. So it's important. And so that gets to the question, how do you make the diagnosis? You suspect yeah. it, you've got the patient and I'm thinking, ooh, is this it? What are the tests? Uh, what's your sort of diagnostic workflow? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, the big uh, emergency we, that we never want to overlook is uh, light chain amyloidosis, which is that hematologic process. So the first step in any diagnostic algorithm is to rule that out. And the way we do that is with monoclonal uh, protein studies, um, with free light chain assessment in the uh, uh, plasma as well as the or serum as well as the urine, um, and a mass or immunofixation uh, to specifically rule out a monoclonal process. Now, after that has been ruled out, um, Historically, endomyocardial biopsy has been the gold standard. But as, but as you can imagine, these patients are increasingly elderly with multiple comorbidities, and you actually have to have access to a cath lab, which could prolong the diagnostic process if you want. Uh, but lo and behold, we've recently, in the last uh, few years, discovered that a, a very old bone tracer, which is a technician-based uh, bone radio tracer, uh, seems to have a positive predictive value you after you have ruled out uh, uh, light chain amyloid that approaches 100%. So essentially, if you've ruled out uh, light chain uh, amyloidosis with monoclonal protein studies, and you have a positive nuclear uh, technetium-based um, scintigraphy that shows that you have myocardial uh, uh, uptake, uh, then that is uh, really, um, uh, your diagnosis is made. Obviously, after you have suspected it with supportive echocardiographic or MRI-based imaging and uh, this uh, non-invasive nuclear um, PYP scan uh, for, for short. Um, so uh, it no longer is a uh, difficult diagnosis to make. Um, uh, it no longer is an invasive diagnosis to make. So this is really, uh, it's been a huge um, leap, if you want, in the field of non-invasive nuclear imaging uh, that uh, we have stumbled upon uh, over the course of the last few years. What's the role of, say, PYP versus MRI? When would you get one versus the other if amyloid is in your mind? Sure. So MRI um, is a great tool, and we uh, invariably use it even, uh, even in the era of PYP. It's a supportive diagnostic tool uh, that tells you that there's actual 
amyloid infiltration. Um, but the subtype of amyloid, de de defining if it's light chain or, or TTR, it's very difficult to do that on MRI. Actually, it's you can't really differentiate. So that's where, um, uh, while MRI is important, it's the first step if you want. Uh, uh, it could replace echo or echo could replace MRI sometimes in that identifying that, okay, this is an infiltrative cardiomyopathy, but beyond, uh, that looks like amyloid. There are certain mm -hmm. features on MRI which um, such as abnormal myocardial nulling, uh, elevation in the extracellular volume, things like this uh, that will tell you, okay, yes, this looks like an amyloid cardiomyopathy. However, it does not differentiate between light chain and TTR. And for that, you really need those uh, protein studies. You really need that, um, but what we call bone scintigraphy because technetium pyrophosphate is actually a bone tracer. Um, um, and um, we, you know, uh, here in the States, we use uh, technetium pyrophosphate overseas. Uh, in Europe, they use technetium DPD, which is another uh, bone tracer that's used uh, also for this diagnosis. So so MRI is complementary, uh, but not diagnostic. Uh, and really, it's the PYP scan with your light chains that are that is diagnostic. Now, there are overlap cases. So the more we do this technique, the more we learn of caveats to, 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 um, to its application. Because as patients get older, sometimes they have overlap clinical pictures so that they could have a monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance and they could have PYP uptake. And um, uh, we've found cases now where you have both processes in patients uh, because you know the older they get, the more prone they are to something like uh, TTR cardiac amyloid with an underlying monoclonal gammopathy. The diagnosis is really difficult and you need tissue. And so while this technique is excellent in the, uh, uh, in the bulk of patients, there are certainly uh, are, uh, cases where we still depend on endomyocardial biopsy. So, but it no longer is the rule, rather the exception, if you want, uh, to the diagnostic journey. Yeah. Well, Dr. Abu Ezzedin, thank you. This has been really informative for an important condition where the treatment really in the past few years has completely, both diagnosis and treatment, turned around and made a big impact in our patients' lives. So thank you for bringing us up to date on this topic. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, and I uh, look forward to chatting with you more about it another time. Thank Thanks. you.